All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for logging in. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, this evening to have with us uh, Thomas Rowe QC, uh, who is a barrister at the very well-regarded set of chambers in London named Three Hair Court. Uh, Thomas is an experienced Queen's Counsel who appears regularly at the Privy Council to argue a number of appeal cases there, uh, which is why we are very uh, fortunate and very lucky to have uh, Thomas with us this evening to speak about a topic that he is familiar with, uh, which is appellate advocacy. Uh, Thomas, welcome. Uh, could I begin by asking if you could tell us a bit about your uh, yourself and your practice uh, as well? Sure. Well, um, as you said, I'm a I'm a barrister here in England at um, at uh, Three Hair Court uh, in London. Um, I started off. Um, at the bar in 1995, I was called to the bar in 1995. Um, having done a done a degree in English English, English literature and law, um, I uh, was appointed uh, senior counsel, Queen's counsel, as we still call it here, in 2014. And my work nowadays uh, consists, I, I suppose, broadly. I mean, it, like everybody in practice, it changes from from day to day and week to week, depending on on uh, the demands of clients. But it broadly consists of two main areas. One is um, essentially commercial and um, chancery dispute resolution of one sort or another, uh, which would include things like uh, corporate disputes, disputes about between shareholders, disputes between companies and their directors, uh, directors who have misbehaved in some way or other or who are accused of having misbehaved in some way or other. Uh, property disputes, um, usually in a, in a corporate um, or commercial context, um, and sometimes straightforward commercial contractual disputes, uh, quite a lot of insolvency uh, angles to that as well, um, and sometimes also uh, what one might call broadly civil fraud, uh, which is there's obviously an overlap between that and, for example, the director's um, cases. So uh, that, that's, that, that's about half of what I do, roughly speaking. And then the other uh, area of my practice is in uh, constitutional uh, and human rights and administrative law. And that has two main uh, areas, I suppose, or uh, two main sources in, in my case. One is that uh, for many years when I was a junior counsel, I was um, engaged by the government here to defend the government in the courts. Uh, they have a panel system and you are on, you can apply to become a member of their panel, which then means you can be eligible to appear for the government in the uh, in the English courts. So I spent a lot of time doing that, uh, not only I mean, because it, because of the independent bar that we have um, here, as in other many other jurisdictions, uh, not only defending the government, but sometimes appearing against the government as well um, in different cases. Uh, and then the other aspect of that is is uh, what gives rise in particular to the appellate work, which is dealing with uh, appeals from those jurisdictions that still retain the Privy Council as its final as their final court of appeal, many of which are constitutional claims arising out of the written constitutions of uh, of the um, of the jurisdictions. Uh, and in those instances, again, I act quite a lot of the time for governments, but equally um, against governments as well. And I've got by way of example at the moment, I've got one case on the go, which is coming up for hearing next month, which is all about one government's response to the covid pandemic and whether of certain lockdown rules, prohibiting gatherings and so on and so forth were compatible with the constitution. And I got another claim where I'm acting against the government of a different Commonwealth jurisdiction, um, seeking to show that their um, rules in that case in relation to COVID vaccination and the requirement to show vaccination passports, um, seeking to show that they're inconsistent with the constitution. So I get to see both sides of the, both, both sides of the, of the debate. Um, so I hope that gives you a broad flavor of what it is that I do. No, no, it does. Thank you very much for that. Um, have you always wanted to be a barrister, Thomas? Um, no, not quite always, actually. I went to university not knowing what I wanted to do. As I've already said, I think I read English literature um, at university. That was actually the subject I went to university to read, which I enjoyed very much because I like reading, I like books, I like writing about books, etc., etc. That's what um, I wanted, I was, I was interested in. But it began to dawn on me at that point that, uh, that um, I needed at some stage to start earning a living. And I was lucky that the place I'd chosen to go to university to read English literature also happened to do a very good law course. And uh, I began to notice that I had friends who studied law and that seemed, from what they said, rather interesting. Interesting, you got to essentially argue about um, the application of rules and principles 
two sets of facts, which um, struck me as interesting. Um, and then I noticed that actually you could be you could actually go on from university and end up being paid to argue with people, which struck me as even better. Um, and I've I've um, to this day never quite lost my sense of amazement that actually we can get paid to uh, go and argue with each other, which if you're of an argumentative frame of mind, I think is a marvelous, uh, marvelous thing. So so um, the short answer is no, I haven't always wanted to be a barrister, but that's that's when it that, that's when it dawned on me that that's what I wanted to do. And I think like a lot of us by now, I can't think of doing anything else uh, because it's, um, it's it's such an absorbing profession that uh, that uh, we're very lucky to very lucky to have it. Uh, did you did you uh, do your pupillage at the uh, Three Hair Court, which is where you are at the moment? I, I didn't actually. No, I, I did my uh, pupillage at uh, a different set of chambers, not very far from here, uh, which did a really uh, even broader range actually of common law work, both common law work and indeed some family um, matrimonial uh, dispute type work. Um, Partly because at that stage I wasn't quite sure what 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 areas I wanted to go into, and partly because that was just where I wound up at the end of the end of the process of getting pupillage. Um, and it was actually a very good it was a very good place to start because I spent my first few years um, at the bar. I was there for about five years, uh, going almost constantly every week, day after day, to court to do all manner of of very simple, obviously basic bits of court work. Uh, but it meant that you were constantly having to see. Uh, how does it work in court? How do you persuade a judge of your proposition? How do you deal with difficult witnesses? Uh, and it doesn't it didn't really seem, seem to me it didn't really matter that the, 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 the sort of work I was doing was not particularly glamorous. Uh, the, there are different paths into the law in, in all jurisdictions, I'm sure. And certainly in, in England, a different path is to start off being third junior counsel, fourth junior counsel um, on some enormous case where you get the privilege of watching one of the leaders of your profession arguing, but you're essentially watching and taking a note and occasionally contributing, um, which is good in a way. But it, what, doesn't, what it doesn't teach you is the real craft, I think, of, of actually having to deal with things yourself from the first, going off to uh, far-flung courts, sometimes even doing criminal work, defending defending people on small criminal charges, um, which is not very glamorous, but it, it gets you into the gets you into the idea of how it is that you might go about trying to persuade um, a, a tribunal to uh, to be interested in what your points are and uh, to uh, to prefer them if possible though of course as always in our job it depends upon um, the cards that you're dealt. Sure and, and what led to you joining uh, the chambers that you are at at the moment three air court? Um, uh, well the, our, our reputation as um, a set that uh, does a, a lot of the sort of things that I was very interested in doing the uh, the opportunities to do the sort of appellate work that I now do, the international uh, flavor, um, and the fact that ultimately it's just a place with a lot of very good advocates and advisors in it. Um, that, that was the perception that I had from outside when I was thinking about seeing whether I could get in through the door. And um, luckily I did get in through the door many years ago uh, and it's been, been amply borne out. So I've been very lucky um, to be um, in this environment and wh where we have, and we, we have a, uh, as I say, an interesting mix of people, a uh, mix of work, interesting mix of people, and we're lucky to be very well supported by uh, some very excellent uh, clerks who keep us in order, um, deal with administrative and, and fee aspects on our behalf very efficiently and very, very quickly, and uh, keep us in line, basically. Sure. Well, would you say that you had a, uh, a mentor in your formative years at the bar? I probably had a, had a few actually, um, but I mean, you met, you mentioned we were chatting earlier before we got going properly. You, we, you mentioned uh, my uh, former colleague James Dingermans, who's now Lord Just and Lord Justice of Appeal. He's gone on to the uh, to the bench and um, seems to be prospering there. And I spent a lot of time working with him as his his junior. And uh, yeah, he he he. I suppose if I had to pick somebody, he would be somebody um, among those who I um, learned a lot from. Um, and um, it's one of the good things about our profession, I think, is if you, if you have an opportunity to really work with um, other people close up, you get to see how things are done. Sometimes how things aren't done. People will be like, we all, we all learn as we go along from our own, own experiences, good and bad. And uh, 
yeah, that's uh, that, that's certainly somebody that I um, I learned from, and particularly got an interest in appellate work from because he did a lot, he did a lot of appeal work, um, and he he I think taught me a lot of things that I still try to try to apply in practice. Would you be able to share with us one thing that um, that uh, Sir James taught you that you still apply today? Yeah, I mean, he taught me a lot of things, but I suppose. Um, well, one of them he he, he had, and I, I try to try to emulate it too. He had a quality of um, really never quite being sort of put down. Um, it's quite difficult, as as we all know, when you're in court. Sometimes, particularly with a, a difficult tribunal, as you sometimes draw, um, it's quite difficult to to stick to your guns, uh, keep keep going, uh, not give up, and there's always a temptation to. Um, to take the hint and obviously sometimes you should take the hint if your if your point is going down really badly um but you should never be never be too um reluctant i think to to, to press on and and really try to get the, the court to engage with the point that you're seeking to make and he was very good at that uh, and would um would efficiently quickly without a great waste of words but but firmly put the points he wanted to put and not be dissuaded from doing so and that's a lesson that uh, I learned from him and others, but him in particular, and, and have uh, tried to apply ever since. Right. Um, Thomas, uh, to, to what extent would you say your current uh, portfolio of cases is comprised of appellate, appellate briefs? My current portfolio of cases, I mean, it varies from time to time. It's probably at any one time between about probably a third and a half, I expect. Um, most of the appellate work that I tend to do uh, is appellate work where I've been brought in to deal with the appeal. So I'm reviewing uh, cases in the courts below that I'm I'm reading into in the same way that the appeal judges would be. Uh, but a certain element at any, any one time is usually cases where I've um, where I've either succeeded below and I'm responding to an appeal by the other side, or or from time to time not succeeded below, but but reckon that we really ought to have succeeded, and so I try, I try to put that right in the in the court of appeal or or, or above. Sure. Would you say you you prefer arguing appeals uh, to trials or um, or, uh, or not? And if you do prefer appeals, why do you say so? That's an interesting question. Um, I it's quite hard to say whether I prefer uh, arguing appeals to trials. I mean, it, it, it's it's really a question of taste, and you know, it's like um, it's like asking somebody whether they prefer one sort of food or another. I mean, the answer may well be yes at one time. And <laughs> when you've had quite a lot of one sort of food, you think actually it's time for a change. And it's rather the same, I think, in my case. I, I, I'm, I'm, I mentioned earlier that my practice is quite a broad one. And uh, one of the things that I think I would not have enjoyed if I had gone to a very, very specialist set of chambers that did nothing but one sort of thing. There are the, 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 may, maybe the same way you are, but there are sets of chambers here that say, you know, we do essentially nothing but inquiries about about um, zoning or planning rules and that sort of thing. I, I, I would find that uh, a too dull a diet, so I enjoy the variety, which is why I think it's difficult to say, do I prefer uh, appeals or trials? I think that there, there's an aspect to uh, appeals which I find particularly, I do find particularly appealing, which is that um, the the arguments are there laid out to some extent in advance. You have the, you have the time to think them through. There is less, predict, there is less unpredictability, um, but that that's, can be part of the fun of trials. I, I don't just do appeals. I do I do quite a lot of trial work as well. And trials are different because, um, as you'll know, the the element of uncertainty is there. You don't know what a witness is going to say. It's quite a different sort of um, sort of skill. So um, yeah, on the whole, I do I do prefer appeals because I think it gives you an opportunity to really think through and argue um, interesting points of law, but also the application of of the law to particular facts gives you a chance really to try in a slightly more expansive context to to um, persuade the tribunal to see a problem your way and not not the other side's way. Sure. Um, uh, Thomas, as I understand it, the, the appellate structure in the UK comprises of, uh, of two tiers, and um, uh, unless I'm wrong. Uh, yes, one, that's right. One, one being the Court of Appeal and the other being the Supreme Court. Uh, would you say there is a difference uh, in the advocacy required uh, between those two courts? Yes, I think there is actually. They're they're, they're quite different um, animals, really. The Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. The the Court of Appeal here um, deals with appeals from essentially all of the all of the first instance courts, 
um, and some appeals from from within the from the tribunal system. We have tribunals for various a uh, separate tribunal system for various sorts of specialist dispute, like certain employment disputes and property disputes and so on. But the Court of Appeal is very much the the working court that deals with uh, a large volume of appeals uh, from from those uh, from from all, all across the spectrum of courts. And that means that it's a very busy court. Uh, it gets a lot of applications for permission to appeal. We have a fairly strict um, system now of the requirement for permission to appeal, leave to appeal um, to the Court of Appeal, which is obtainable only by paper application. A few years ago, in the interest of efficiency, they abolished the right to go back if you got knocked back on paper and have a go orally in front of the court that tried to trying to persuade the court to grant you leave that's gone i think personally that's a that's a retrograde step and i think it's a shame because you can actually sometimes show judges things um speaking to them directly that you can't on paper but that's where we that's where we are so you need in the court of appeal to be um very aware of the fact that that you are dealing with a busy court uh, which is i think temperamentally quite inclined to to let judge, 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 judgments of the High Court stand uh, rather than engaging with, with appeals. So you've really got to find, here's an interesting point, here's something that I can clearly show you if you're an appellant and has gone wrong with this case and get them interested that way. By the time it gets to the Supreme Court, uh, you will have had a hearing in the Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court is not there as a further appeal court, as it constantly reminds us, but as a, a court that deals with only cases of general public interest. So you need to get to the Supreme Court to find some point which is not just um, an instance of having something gone wrong uh, in the lower courts, but something gone wrong in a way which is significant. And they do sometimes turn down applications for leave to appeal in the Supreme Court on the basis that simply on the basis it doesn't raise a point of general public importance, which I think by implication means that they are sometimes content to see things happen in the Court of Appeal, which perhaps are not as uh, quite as they ought to be. But if it doesn't raise a point of general public importance, they don't take the case because that is their role. And once you get there, if you've got leave, you are then dealing with a court which has a lot more time to consider the issues a bit more holistically, think about the law as a whole. Uh, it's much more like a almost like a sort of academic seminar in some respects. It's a very discursive uh, process, a lot of discussion and um, you can get you you can get away to a certain well get away with not right, the right way of saying it but you can you can deploy in the supreme court a technique that you couldn't deploy in the court of appeal because they want to get on and hear quite quickly if you're the appellant what's wrong with this judgment below um and uh, and move on to the next case which is not a criticism of them they've got a lot of, lot of work to deal with they have to be efficient in that way the supreme court is designed to be a more reflective court that, that can think more broadly about the law right uh -huh. How long would you say a case uh, uh, would take at the Court of Appeal insofar as arguments is concerned? Well, now, historically, they would take they, they would they would they, they let things run on quite a lot. Nowadays, they are um, they are much more keen to keep to a strict timetable. I mean, to be fair, the Supreme Court does it and the Privy Council do the same as well. We, we are now expected in all of those courts to agree a timetable for submissions in advance. But. Uh, the days when you would have several days arguing a case in the Court of Appeal seem to be pretty much long gone, unless it's a really enormous case with lots and lots and lots of issues. So typically an appeal in the Court of Appeal might be listed for a day, perhaps two days, that sort of period of time. And similarly, actually, in the, in the Supreme Court or the Privy Council, uh, rather, than, rather than much longer. And you're expected to get on with it. And of, co and of course, a lot of the advocacy now will have been done in advance in writing because of the uh, requirement for what we still call skeleton arguments, although uh, the metaphor of the skeleton is, I think, increasingly um, an inapt one because they, they, they contain quite a lot of the argument that you that you put forward um, rather than just being as they were. I remember when I first started very much a series of bullet points, giving a, a, a little hint of what it is you're going to say. Sure. Now, we, we spoke about the Privy Council uh, uh, a little. Um, would you say there is a difference between the advocacy required there and the Supreme Court? They're, they're pretty similar because, uh, for one thing, it's generally the same judges that you're dealing with. The Privy Council consists essentially of the same judges as sit in our Supreme Court, our law lords, as, the, as they were until the reforms in 2009 that, that brought the Supreme Court into existence uh, in place of the, of the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords. Uh, so to that extent, there is there isn't much of a difference. I think there is there is a difference in this respect, though, that they by definition they are dealing in the in the Privy Council with appeals 
that don't come from within their own jurisdiction that they're used to having having come up through through the ranks of um because obviously the supreme court justices are all former uh lawyers in one of the one of the three united kingdom jurisdictions england and wales scotland or northern ireland and so they'll be relatively familiar with the territory in the privy council they are dealing with judgments of courts in a, a variety of different places which have different ways sometimes of, of doing things and and different and the law although there's generally usually a common theme of common law uh, and many of the statutes look pretty similar the companies act of Trinidad and Tobago looks pretty similar to the Companies Act in in uh, most of the Commonwealth countries, uh, but there will be differences, and so it's necessary to take the time to take the court through those differences, make sure that they're fully understood. I mean, they're, and they're 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 very they're interested in them. They're not that they're this is um, it's something I think which comes as a surprise. I've I've read this in, for example, memoirs that judges have written when they've when they've retired and talked about their their time um, on the bench. Not that I have very much time to spend reading that sort of thing, but occasionally. Um, and uh, they talk about how surprised they are that when they become justices of the Supreme Court, uh, they suddenly find themselves having to deal with these cases from jurisdictions that they hadn't had any previous dealings with and that they find it quite interesting sometimes. So so that, that that's a difference. Um, but the fundamentals, I think, are the same. Making the points that you want to make clearly, attractively, uh, that's the same wherever you are. Sure. You, you mentioned that, that um... Quite oftentimes, the cases that are heard at the Supreme Court um, involve principles that may be a little different um, from the principles that that, uh, that apply in the UK. Have you found that to be a challenge when, when you're preparing for a case at the Supreme Court, having to deal with principles from other jurisdictions that, that may be different? Um, yeah, it is a challenge, and it, it can it can be um, it can be a very interesting challenge. Uh, I mean, there are different aspects to that. There are for example, procedural aspects. Um, some, of, for example, I mentioned Trinidad and Tobago earlier. They they have um, a constitution which speaks, amongst other uh, other things, of the right to the protection of the law. And the the local courts in Trinidad and Tobago have developed that um, protection in a quite expansive way. Um, one might almost say a sort of activist way on the part of the judges, in a way that probably wouldn't have happened here. Um, and so there is, I think, when you're appear, appearing in a case that it raises those sort of issues before the uh, the Privy Council, there's a, a slight sort of tension between the way in which the local courts will uh, habitually, have habitually dealt with that and the perhaps more small c conservative approach to those issues that you get in, in this jurisdiction. So that's very interesting. And that, that's a, that's a thing you need to to, to factor in and, and um, take account of. Of course, there are some cases in the Privy Council where the dif difference is, is really extraordinary because you are dealing with jurisdictions which, for historical reasons, don't use the common law or don't use the common law to a large extent. So there are, of course, some jurisdictions, Mauritius, St. Lucia, for example, where the law is essentially French law, um, which is a really peculiar um, thing to be doing. But um, it's fascinating as, a, as an advocate um, to uh, be involved in it. You're hopefully guided to some extent by by those who have dealt with the case in the courts below, who who do know something about the about the field of law, but um, yeah, it's 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 fascinating, and I've, I've over the years, from time to time, had had um, great fun looking up um, instances of uh, decisions in other jurisdictions. You have to mine quite carefully to find where 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 you can find assistance. Um, I recall looking looking at some French Canadian decisions from Quebec to see whether there was stuff there that might assist in an, in an appeal in St. Lucia. So that's it's one of the great privileges, I think, of appearing in the Privy Council that you get to you get to deal with that sort of different different system. Um, but ultimately, I mean, ultimately, I think that that the, the 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 legal principles that you get from one jurisdiction to another, although there are they may be very differently expressed, are not fundamentally always that different. One of the one of the things I'm quite interested in is and I'm um, uh, I'm a member of the organization here called the British German Jurist Association, um, which mixes British and German lawyers. And I'm quite interested sometimes in in speaking to them about about their law and that they, they come at things very differently in a civilian system. But uh, by and large, the, the, the outcomes of cases are what you'd expect they, them to be, you know, whether you're a director having duties at common law or, or a, a manager of a company under a civilian law system. It's pretty, pretty clear what you can and can't get away with doing. That, that's fascinating. Um, uh, Thomas, if I can ask you if you think there are differences uh, in the advocacy required uh, for appeals as compared to that at uh, first instance. 
Yeah, I think that I think they are quite they are quite different things. I mean, there are obviously some co common features that that any advocate in any case ought to take account of. The obvious things, really, brev you know, brevity, uh, clarity, uh, firmness, not being put off your stride by uh, by the way that the court is dealing with things, but being prepared to um, go with the flow. If the court is interested in a particular issue, deal with that when the court wants it to be dealt with, and not necessarily when you want it to be dealt with. So there are common features. But I think that the, the, the main differences uh, relate uh, to, well, the main difference, they re relate to the, the, to the fact that you've got generally in a trial witnesses, which of course is a completely different skill, wit witness handling. And it's a, lot, it's a lot less predictable. It goes back to your question earlier about what does one prefer? I think sometimes um, there's a great excitement about doing a trial because you've got to cross-examine some witness. You know broadly what the documents say, but you don't know what the witness is going to say about them. You don't know whether you're going to be able to trap the witness into um, accepting that um, what he or she has said can't be right, um, or how you're going to bring out in cross-examination that what he or she is saying is, is not right. So there's an unpredictability about it, whereas in an appeal, by this point, obviously the whole case has gone through at first instance, so we know roughly what it's about, we know what the judge decided, we know what the evidence was, that can't be changed. The parameters there are, therefore are, are fixed, and uh, so you don't need to be as as um, prepared for the totally unexpected in appellate advocacy, but you do need by that point to be focused in a way that perhaps you don't have to be as much, or you can't be as much at first instance, because you know by now what the evidence is. And so you've got to stay within those boundaries and set out your points systematically clearly um, in a way that it's, it's less easy to do when it's a first instance and you've, 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 um, you've got a lot of a massive evidence to try to to, to control to the extent you can and then get on top of and summarize. Sure, yeah, we'll, we'll come to the issue of um, being focused and, and, and structuring one's argument in, in, in an appeal uh, a little later on. Uh, but if I can take you to, to uh, the time when you are first uh, given an appellate brief, uh, would you be able to talk us through the steps that you ordinarily take to uh, familiarize yourself with the facts and to also prepare uh, yourself for the appeal uh, itself? What are the documents that you would read first? Um, and, and what are the notes that you would um, ordinarily take? Sure. I mean, it, it's, I think the, one, one thing I, I was taught many, many years ago, and it's always been a, a good bit of advice, I think, to give to anybody, is the first thing actually is at the earliest opportunity, look at at least the judgments in the courts below. And what I mean by that is if you, if you get you know, you get you get the email come, coming through saying, you know, "I'd like you to, I'd like you to help us, please, with this appeal," and you might see that actually you don't need to do anything immediately because it's the appeal's coming up in a few months' time, and your documents aren't due in for a few weeks, and you've got plenty of other things on. So there's a temptation to say that's interesting. I'll put that to one side. If you, as soon as you get the opportunity, my advice would always be look at it because once you start thinking about it, then even if it's not formally on 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 the client's time. Maybe that you're out for a run in the morning and it suddenly dawns on you there might be an interesting point here or an interesting point there. Your, your brain is working on it. So that's a good piece of advice, first of all. But what you read, first of all, are the judgments below, I would say. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the appeal judges um, will not have been completely steeped in the case. Obviously, if you're being brought in to argue an appeal, nor will you. But very often you're you're dealing with an appeal of a case that you yourself have been involved in. Um, and so... Um, it's important to remember that uh, the judges who hear the appeal aren't completely um, steeped in the in all the detail of the case. So, I would I would read the I would read the judgments first. I would um, people vary as to what sort of notes they take. Um, you know, I've I've seen I uh, sometimes go go into court and see my opponent sitting there with an enormous stack of handwritten notes. Um, I don't tend to do that very much. I tend to take fairly brief notes and read it fairly quickly and write a few notes of what seem to be the really important points. But that's very much a matter of personal style. Um, but yeah, you've really just got to get on top of on top of what the facts are in the case, uh, what the arguments were and uh, start thinking immediately. Uh, I think strategically, if you're if you're if you're responding to the appeal, uh, what are the what are the essential elements of this case? What are the essential bits that the judge clearly got right? Probably there are things that you could argue that the judge got wrong. They will be argued the judge got wrong, and you may have to concede that. But what are the essential things that the judge got right? And if you're appealing, um, what's the what are the what are the fundamental flaws in this that you can you can 
um, identify. I think it's often a mistake, and I see this quite a lot in in uh, in appellate uh, submissions, particularly between first instance and the Court of Appeal. It's a mistake, I think, to put in too many grounds of appeal, 15, 20, 30 reasons why the judge got it wrong. I mean, usually, I mean, maybe the judge, maybe there are 30 reasons in some cases, but usually you can you can find a a, a handful of of decent, powerful points. And your task, I think, from the moment you start reading is to think about what those might be. Um, now, um, uh, Thomas, uh, oftentimes in, in an appeal, uh, there would be certain uh, difficulties in your client's case. Uh, yeah. Irrespective, uh, irrespective of whether you're the appellant or, or the respondent, uh, particularly if you're the appellant, acting for the appellant, uh, those uh, um, pitfalls would would often uh, appear at the in the judgment in itself that is on the uh, on appeal. Um, would you be able to tell us how you deal with those difficulties when you're presenting your case on appeal? Well, I think you have no choice but to confront them. Really, it's a great mistake to hope that they won't be noticed um, and not to deal with them. So you've just got to try to to uh, confront them uh, if you've got. If you've got, let's say, um, a case where you're appealing, but the judge has made factual findings which are adverse to your client, then you've got to face up to the fact that those factual findings are going to be quite hard to dislodge in the Court of Appeal unless you've got some really quite compelling grounds for uh, for doing it. And the uh, across, I think, across the common law world, certainly it's true in, in this jurisdiction, the appellate courts have gone to great lengths in recent years to, to emphasise the deference that they um, will um, a, a, a accord to judgments of first instance on questions of fact, really saying that if the judge, unless the judge has gone completely wrong, then you are you are stuck with those findings. So you've got to you've got to keep that in mind when you're trying to to deal with the the pitfalls in your case. If you're the appellant, and the trouble is that uh, you know your client gave evidence uh, in a way which is uh, didn't impress the judge on certain matters, then you've you, you can't shy away from that. You can't ignore it and hope no one will notice. You've got to you've got to look carefully at that and decide. Well, either is there some is there some basis for saying really the judge got it completely wrong when the judge was so critical of of my client uh, in this this or that respect, and identify those those points. But recognize you've got a big hurdle to get over. Or is there some way which you can try and get around that and say well yes okay this evidence was unsatisfactory but. Um, nevertheless, the justice of the case is still different from the way in which the judge saw it, and the law is different from the way the judge saw it. So uh, don't, don't shy away from that. And I think you get much more respect from the Court of Appeal if you don't shy away from it. Um, it it's 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 much better to turn up if you're the appellant saying, you know, we accept that the judge found that in certain respects our evidence was unsatisfactory. We accept that the judge found that our client's conduct was unsatisfactory in certain respects. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, the end result was correct for these reasons. And I think that's much more impressive for, for an appeal court than simply bludgeoning on and, and, and trying to uh, trying to ignore all of those all of those aspects um, because you don't get you don't get the credit that you need to get from from the appeal court. I think it's very it's very important to um, to try to get the appeal judges to to trust that when you say these were the facts, for example, this was the evidence you're you're giving a fair and accurate summary of what the position was. And if you don't conf if you don't face up to the fact that there were difficulties and just try and gloss over them, then you lose credit. And so everything that you say uh, is is to some, to, some, to some extent suspect. And I think that the cat, there's a tendency I've noticed in a lot of written submissions to uh, to go so enthusiastically into your into the merits of your client's case. This is particularly to an appeals, but also at first instance, um, that the, 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 the document that the judge is holding, the, the skeleton argument or the brief, whatever we want to call it, depending on the jurisdiction, is worth a lot less. The, the brief or, or submissions that the judge will place more reliance upon is the one that sticks scrupulously to what the established facts are, doesn't, doesn't shy away from difficulties, um, but tries to build on that as a, as a firm foundation for the submissions. So I think that's... That's what I would. That's what I would say to those who who you know are wondering about how do you deal with pitfalls. Is you you've got to, you've got to face up to them. Sure, uh, uh, Thomas. Did you often work uh, in a team when arguing uh, an appeal? 
Uh, yeah, my, quite a lot of the time I do. I usually um, usually find myself working in a team nowadays, usually heading up the team. Like not not always. I, occasion, occasionally I uh, find myself uh, being being led by a more, more senior Queen's Council um, on a really big case. Uh, but yeah, usually I do, do find myself um, working in a team, which is, you know, which is, which is great. It's, um, it's more, far more interesting way to do it in many ways than, than sitting entirely solitary um, uh, on your own, um, trying to work it all out for yourself. Uh, and is there a typical way you, you divide the work amongst your team? I try to, I mean, if I'm usually, I, I've, we're, we're very lucky here. We've got a lot of very good, uh, very good junior counsel. Um, uh, so I would try to, yeah, I would, I would try to do it in this way. I think first of all, say let, let's everybody try and read everything that we can read that we need to read. I might have an initial meeting with with the with the rest of the team, or usually usually with the junior council in particular, and say, look, let's read. Let's make sure we've all read at least this, this, and this. Then we meet meet back again, discuss it. What do we think? What are the points? You know, if we're appealing, what are the what are the flaws we can find in the judgment? If we're responding, what are the things we can do to try and shore this judgment up? In the eyes of the appellate court, um, and then I would often say, I would often say to the junior, right, go, go go away and come back and give me a draft of the of our written submissions. Um, and I, I want, I'd much rather have a draft than a sort of note saying, well, you know, here are some points in our favour, here are some points against. Um, I'm not really sure. And that's the other thing. Other thing I, I do say um, uh, to when I remember, which I. Usually do to a junior is is I want to hear you know I want to hear your opinions on this I don't I don't just want to hear um, sort of equivocal statements I mean by all means if 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 a point if a point can be argued both ways I'd like to know if there are cases against us I want to know about it but but I, I do want your input as a lawyer and not just as a researcher. Sure, and uh, when you're on your feet uh, in court, uh, what do you ordinarily expect from a second chair or a third chair? Yeah, well, I'm, when I'm my when I'm on my feet, um, what I'd like to have is in an ideal world, something like this. When the judge says, Mr. Rowe, uh, can you remind us, was there any evidence um, about whether Mr. Chan did or didn't uh, speak to the uh, other directors before such and such a decision was taken? Uh, I can say I can I can. I can give myself a couple of moments to say, well, uh, my lord, my lady, uh, I think there was some evidence about that. It came up on day three of the trial. Uh, but the specific thing that was said was, and by that point, I can put my hand out and hopefully my junior by that stage has handed me uh, either, either a laptop with or, 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 a, or a hard copy bundle, open uh, the relevant page with, a, with a, a, a finger pointing out exactly the right bit. And I can say smoothly to the judge, I think you'll find the answer to that question is on page uh, 276 of volume C, whatever it might be. That 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 that's an that's ideal. So what what I mean to say really is is uh, familiarity with all of the papers. That's one of the great things that that uh, the luxury of having a a bigger team around you gives you. Because the reality is, as the as the lead advocate, you're probably the lead advocate in quite a few other cases. And with the best will in the world, you will have read everything, but you won't necessarily have absorbed absolutely every page of everything. Um, to a point where you can recall it with photographic accuracy. So it's great to have a team around you that have had more time than you perhaps to, to read it all and know where stuff is. So that's what I that's what I'd like to have when I'm on my feet. Um, but I'd also also like uh, to have going back to what I was saying earlier about not just wanting a researcher, I would like to have a view as to how things are going and what what the second chair thinks. Um, you know, the clients are paying for the second chair to be there. Um, it's an extremely expensive form of note taking if that's all it is. Uh, so it's got to be more than that. It's got to be um, something which is which is useful in terms of making sure that that uh, every point has been thought of. Which I, for which I, don't, I don't, of course, mean interrupting, <laughs> getting up and saying, "I'm afraid I disagree with my leader about that." But I do, I, I do mean, you know, when there are breaks when we're discussing it, uh, I'm always perfectly happy to be to be challenged by the second chair. You know, have you thought about this point? What about that point? You know. Um, I, I, won't, I won't promise always to follow that advice, but it's useful to have, have your own views of these things tested. Sure. Uh, Thomas, we, we earlier spoke about um, being uh, focused when you're arguing in appeal. Um, and uh, like something that I've heard before is that uh, when, when you're arguing in appeal, you have to be a bit selective as to the arguments that you present. 
Um, now, if you agree with that advice, um, how would you suggest that, that we um, select the arguments to be presented on appeal and uh, discount others? Well, they've got to be they've got to be the ones that actually matter that make a difference to uh, to the to the outcome. It's very easy, I think, when you read through a judgment to find fault with it. The judge misunderstood this bit of the evidence, misunderstood that bit of the evidence, perhaps. You know, um, the judge made criticisms of a witness that, that perhaps are unfair. And lay clients, of course, un perfectly understandably, uh, get very um, angry about that. And, and if they if they've given evidence um, and maybe they were telling the truth, maybe they, they were doing the best they could to to recall events. But the judge has formed an unfavorable view and has said, I didn't accept this part of the evidence. Um, it's it's obviously from the from the client's point of view, very unsatisfactory. And you will come under great pressure to I'm sure you've experienced this pressure to try and put that right. But you've what you've got to focus on relentlessly, I think, is is what are the things that will make the difference? You've got to um, really you've got you. Uh, this is true of closing submissions at first instance as well. Uh, but, but you've got to. But it's particularly important to think in an appeal. You've got to think about what do I want the judgment of the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court, wherever you are, to say? What are the, what's the route map that I want them to follow? And then you you uh, you choose the the route which is the most easy to um, to accomplish. Uh, it's not like it's not like if you've been I don't know, if you've been following the, the Winter Olympics. It's not like the, uh, you know, the, the, the skiing events where uh, the trick is to go down and, and do as many tricks as you possibly can on the way on the way down as, uh, and impress people by your brilliance at uh, doing back somersaults uh, as you go over jumps and so on. Um, it's about getting from the top to the bottom safely. Uh, and getting to the bottom um, of the of the hill. In other words, getting to the position where the court can say, by whatever reasoning it, it does it, um, the answer is that the appeal is allowed and, and you, the, you get the relief that you were denied at first instance, or if you're responding, the appeal is dismissed and the first instance decision is upheld. And the ob object of the exercise is, is not to think of all the fancy, fancy ways in which that could be done. Uh, the object of the exercise is to find the easiest route, find the, find the uh, you know, don't, don't go down the black route uh, if you can go down a red route to keep up my skiing metaphor. Um, so that's what you want to keep in mind. Um, but that, like everything um, in our game, it doesn't, you, you can't follow an absolutely strict pattern all the time. And uh, sometimes it may be that the, the more interesting points are worth deploying because they'll get the court interested in it. If you've got an appeal, which is on the face of it rather humdrum, just really apparently turning at, at face value on, on the judges assessment of some evidence in uh, in a case that doesn't appear to involve any very interesting issues that may not be very easy to get in a court of appeal interested in particularly a busy court of appeal that's got lots of litigants knocking at its door but if you can find something which raises an interesting point of law that might have implications for other cases then you can get the court interested and half the trick i think in in advocacy is to is to get get the court interested in in what you've got to say get them get the court thinking for itself get the court uh, to get the judges to start to to look at the problem in the same way that you do and start to reason through for themselves. So instead of telling them you must do this and this and this, which is never very attractive, uh, you're showing these are the facts and inviting the court to start thinking that perhaps that's the way that that's the way that I, I should reason it. So that that's the test, I think, for for trying to select or those are the tests you can use for selecting your arguments. Um, but don't, don't push it too far, I'd also say. Don't don't uh, don't abandon points just because they're not your best points. You can usually find a way of of leaving the point at least formally being taken because you never know. Okay, it may be that the point you think was a great point doesn't interest them, but there's some point that you thought wasn't so good. But turns out actually you win the appeal on that basis. And if if you decided to abandon it completely, you wouldn't have done. So don't don't chuck it away altogether. Sure. Well, what I've often heard is that um, um, an advocate should have uh, three of his main points and just focus on those three points um, uh, during the hearing. Do you subscribe to that view? Uh, yeah, I think probably I do if, if, they're, if they're good points. I mean, as I say, I wouldn't, I would, yeah, I wouldn't abandon points, but it's, it's a, it really, I mean, not, not even three points. I think one point, if you can find one point is, you know, you've got to have, you've got to have something um, right at the outset, which, which, which the judges can see. This is an important argument. This is, um, you know, either it's preferably, if you're the appellant, preferably it's an argument that has wider implications. 
But even if it doesn't, it's an important argument in this case. It shows why in this particular case there was an injustice if you're applying, if you're acting for the appellant. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think it's. I think that's right. It, it's, it's as I said earlier. I think it's a great mistake to be too diffuse in your arguments uh, because you know if you take sort of fifteen points as to why the judge got it wrong, and then then it just becomes it's un, it's unappetizing for the for the judges. You have to try and think about it from the judge's perspective. Um, and one one of the advantages of, of our profession that we still keep in touch with members of the profession who've gone on to become judges. You, you sometimes hear their moans about about the advocacy they have to deal with and, and, and their praise of the advocacy they have to deal with, which is good. And, and one thing we we are apt to forget, I think, as as uh, lawyers, attorneys working for our, our clients is that uh, although, of course, we focus exclusively at any one moment on our particular client's work, the judges have got tons of people knocking at their door and they've got a huge amount of paper coming through um, and they don't want to have, you know, 15 reasons why this judge was wrong. They want to have some big point that they can they can think think about. Yes, I yes I agree with that. No, I don't agree with that. But at least it's clear. Um, your fifteenth point just won't get noticed at all because there are too many other things going on. Sure, uh, Thomas. If I can ask you um, a question regarding your your notes for oral arguments uh, for, for an appeal, uh, uh, do you do you write down in full your 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 oral, oral arguments or do you uh, typically have uh, headings and just brief points? I, I don't personally tend to write down my oral, oral arguments in full. Um, I mean, I will have done to a certain extent, obviously, in the written submissions, um, because that's what you have to do. And so that that's the that's the guide to it. Um, I will usually write down any legal propositions that I'm asking the, the court to accept so that those aren't just being improvised on my feet, because the exact wording sometimes can be really important. If you're saying to a if you're saying to a court, our, our submission is that the law in this respect is such and such a thing that you need to be clear as to the exact words you're using. So I would write that down. I might well write down an opening opening paragraph or two of the, of the oral submissions I'm going to make so that I've got something to, to hang on to in the opening few minutes. But um, certainly in, in our tradition, and I expect in yours too, uh, you, you pretty rapidly get into questions and it's impossible at that stage to stick to a a pre-prepared script. Uh, so at that point, it is really more a matter of, yeah, matter of headings. And really the, the only um, the, the only thing that you can really do to make sure, and the thing that you must do to make sure that you're successful um, as to the extent you can be uh, as an advocate, I think, is to be so familiar with everything that you've got a clear picture in your mind of where you're going and you've got a clear picture of what the material is that you're dealing with. And if if that's if that's the case, then, then you should be okay. And, and the, the headings that you're going to cover um, will be sufficient. But but uh, as I say, at, at each stage, if it's a proposition, then uh, then you can write that down. And it's quite, it, it, we had a, a, a member of Chambers uh, now um, passed away, but um, called Sir Godfrey Lacane, who was a very distinguished appellate advocate in the Privy Council, did hundreds and hundreds of cases in the Privy Council. And he, he would always structure his submissions in, in terms of a series of propositions, legal propositions, factual propositions, just a line or two, and those, those those are the headings. Get those propositions right, and then, if you've worked them out in the correct way, the ideal is that as soon as one proposition has been accepted, then all the other propositions fall into place as logical consequences of the first proposition. So, if you have a structure like that, then write it down and try and follow it, but but be prepared to be knocked off course. Sure. And, and whilst we're on that point, actually, uh, is there a particular way that you prepare for questions from the from the judges for an appeal? Well, try and think of all the questions that you think you could, you would ask. Try and put yourself in their in their shoes. Try and, as an intellectual exercise, try and imagine that you're arguing it for the other side. What are the what are the points that you would want to, to put if you were um, not being paid to argue for the appellant but for the respondent, uh, and come up with what the arguments, what what the answers will be to those questions. Be ready to make concessions where concessions are um, appropriate. You know, if there if there are problems with your case that you're not going to get away with concealing them, as I said earlier, so you have to be prepared to um, to deal with that uh, and um, prepare for, for for references as well. Often the questions won't be necessarily a deep, profound, you know, profound legal question. <laughs> what what's what's the what's the overall purpose of the law of unjust enrichment? You're not going to get questions like that. You might get that. You might get asked. You know, 
as I said earlier, was was there any evidence about such and such an issue? So anticipate that. Try and have your note ready, even if it, even if it's just a, a reference. So you can say, yes, I think there are, there was some evidence about that. It's on this page. Um, so that's that. That's the way to to do it. But I mean, inevitably, you're going to get questions that that um, you know perhaps you hadn't anticipated and. Maybe we can talk later about how, how you deal with those, but uh, but um, do the best you can to, to anticipate by thinking about how you deal with it if you were the judge. Sure. Actually, what was we're on that point, do you mind telling us how, how you would deal with uh, something unexpected that came from the bench? Yeah, don't, I mean, don't don't be rushed into an answer. Um, there's a great. There's a great temptation, I think. Uh, and you you learn with experience to to overcome it. But there's a great temptation to think that you've got to answer instantly. You're on the spot. Everyone's looking at you. You're going to irritate people if you don't answer instantly. Actually, in my experience, the judges know usually that if they're asking you a tricky question, it's going to be tricky to answer. So take your time. Um, think about it. Sometimes reserve your position. You know, if you really don't know the answer, don't 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 feel I've got to give an answer of some sort. Uh, so I'll give the best answer I can come up with. I mean, you 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 can you can say, well, so far as I know, there was no evidence about that, but I will check and come back to you. Judges would much rather do that. It is meant to be a, a collaborative exercise. You're meant to be helping uh, and them, and they will thank you more if if you are seen to be helping them. So sometimes the answer is I don't know, but we will look into that, and we will tell you after lunch, or we will write we will write to the court with an answer to that question. But um, better better do that than than commit yourself to something which might or might not be right because you're winging it at the time. Sure, uh, Thomas. If I can speak briefly about um, uh, written submissions uh, for an appeal, uh, yeah. how do you usually structure your written submissions uh, for for an appeal case? I, I try to keep them as brief as the case allows. Um, that's my first point, and you will you'll get you'll get thanked for that because, as I said earlier, judges get a lot of paperwork and they. Uh, they don't uh, necessarily want to wade through tons and tons of stuff. I would try to go for a really clear, simple opening. Um, ideally, uh, if you can get onto the first page, the essentials of the case, a summary. I often start with an overview and summary, which is an introduction and summary, which is not just what the case is about, but also in a nutshell, why we say we should win. Uh, and that will set the tone for the rest of it. And then the rest of it, after that, I would have a, an introductory section saying this is what this this is what this written submission is going to deal with. First section will be about this. Second section will be about, will be about this. Uh, and the end point to which we're going is whatever it might be. And then you expand upon each of those points as as briefly as you can, but without miss, missing out all of the essential references. So keep keep it keep it clearly structured and brief, and and you'll be thanked, I think, for the for that. Uh, is there a particular writing style that you you adopt for your written arguments? I try to keep it as as plain and simple as I can. Actually, there's a there's a place for um, for flowery language and elaborate metaphor and uh, hyperbole and exaggeration and uh, and um, vivid writing. But generally, the place for that I think is in novels rather than in in uh, <laughs> in, in written submissions for a court. So. Keep it, keep it very straightforward. Keep it very plain. This is the proposition which I'm advancing. There are three reasons why I say that proposition is right, and here they are: first, secondly, thirdly. Set it all out like that. Keep the keep the elaborate stuff for for um, other occasions. Sure, thanks, Thomas. I, I just have one more question for you, and um, yeah, it is to do with um, how things are at the moment with a lot of hearings done uh, virtually as opposed to uh, in person. Uh, do you yes. think? There is a style of advocacy that is unique uh, for uh, virtual hearings that may not apply uh, for in-person hearings. Yes, I th I've been thinking about this a bit actually, because like like you, I expect I've been doing a lot of lot of uh, virtual advocacy, and uh, I think there is a that there is a style which is a bit different. It, it, in a way, it's a sort of retrograde step, I suppose, but but we need to, to work with it all the same. It is that there is less opportunity online for the sort of conversational approach that you would get in a court, certainly in the Privy Council and the Supreme Court here, uh, when you're there with them in person. It's very much not, here is my speech um, on behalf of the appellant 
followed by perhaps a couple of questions at the end. It's very much an interactive process. You you get half a sentence out and somebody says, well, is that really right? What about this? And you say, well, I see your point. But on the other hand, so, and it's a conversation. And that's much harder to do online. In fact, in the Privy Council and Supreme Court, they've adopted a practice of the judges putting their hands up when they want to interrupt to ask a question, which adds an extra challenge to it because you're trying to keep an eye on the screen to see whether anyone's got their hand up. And it, it, make, it makes it a more... Um, slow process. So uh, my, I suppose my ultimate wish is that it would all go back to normal and we could be in court normally. But there are advantages, of course, to online advocacy, not least that you can you can appear remotely. You don't have to necessarily to be in the same place as the, as the judges. Uh, so I think you need to, we, we need to keep in mind that that there's going to be less of an interactive process, which takes us back to a form that requires you to set it all out perhaps a little more formally than you would do uh, if you are um, if you are there arguing an appeal um, in person. And so you must you must you mustn't expect that things will just emerge through the conversational process. You must be even more clearly structured to make sure that all of the arguments that you want to raise are are firmly and clearly raised. Um, we will end the session there. Thank you so very much. OK, for your time. Well, thank you very much. It's been it's been fun.